Father, today we are dealing with repentance. There is no more important idea than the cross when it comes to repentance. For the cross tells us two things. It shows us how bad our sin is and how great is your grace and love and mercy. We thank you that for our sins, Christ has died. Lord, we do not want merely to confess these sins, but to repent of them, and each one particularly. So, Lord, as we study this important topic of repentance, may it be your Holy Spirit that guides us as we come to understand your word as the Westminster Divine's help as we read this confession together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take a little look at a post-exilic prophet, the prophet uh, Zechariah. So uh, the post-exilic prophets are the three found uh, at the end of the Book of the Twelve, or, the, or what we sometimes call the Minor Prophets. And so those would be Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and Malachi. Uh, Zechariah and Haggai were uh, contemporaries. Um, Malachi writes uh, sometime later. Um, we have to kind of estimate when Malachi writes. Uh, and so Zechariah is, of course, um, the most lengthy of the post-exilic prophets. Uh, we know a lot more about um, from what he says. Uh, he also, if you were in our Revelation class, there are some pieces from Zechariah that are important for understanding uh, Revelation, specifically the four horsemen. Um, and so Zechariah has a lot more apocalyptic um, I, literature uh, contained within there. Um, but there are also just some um, straight prophetic texts that any Christian reading Zechariah will read and say, oh, well, of course, this is something that has to do with Jesus. Uh, and so one of those texts that's found here in chapter 12 toward the end of the book of Zechariah, and we're going to start in verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas uh, for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one who mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning for Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shimeites by itself, and their wives by themselves, and all the families that are left, each by itself, and their wives by themselves. Uh, and so what Zechariah is getting at here is that there's this coming day, right? So there's this uh, concept, especially in the minor prophets, although we can find it in the majors as well, but it's especially a, a, a big idea in the minor prophets um, Joel uh, and Amos being probably chief among them, but you find it uh, in many other places. And it's this concept of, of the Yom Yahweh, the day of the Lord. Uh, and this day of the Lord is this coming day uh, that will be both um, a day of redemption for the faithful uh, and a day of judgment for those who are found to be wicked. Uh, and so what Zechariah is getting at here is that there is a figure uh, present on that day, uh, one who has been pierced, one that they will look upon. Uh, and this one that they look upon, um, will there will be two things happening at the same time uh, when you look at this one. Uh, one will be grace and the other will be uh, mercy. And the idea here is um, this grace and mercy that you receive, we, we could say, well, that's certainly something to celebrate. Um, but there is also a mourning that comes along with it as well. And so when as Protestant Christians, especially, but as Christians in general, uh, when we look upon um, when we look upon the cross, one of the things uh, that we uh, see is the celebration of the redemption uh, that is ours in Christ, that Christ took our place, uh, Christ took our place. And we um, are saved by his sacrifice uh, upon the cross. So what we notice as Protestants especially is that celebratory element, right? that celebratory element that says uh, 
Jesus Christ has saved me from my sins and now I have eternal life. Now I have joy, now I have hope. Um, but there is another piece to that um, that is ours by faith. Uh, and that is this mourning, right? This sorrow, this deep, deep pitted sorrow um, that my salvation cost the blood of Jesus. It, how horrible is my sin that the sinless Jesus should need die for it. Right? That's the other side of this. And so if you're reading through, especially verse 10 here, and you, and you get to this place where you say, okay, um, there is grace and mercy, and those things are great. It means that I am forgiven. It means that I am welcomed into the presence of God. But then we have to say, but there is also this mourning because we look upon the one who has been pierced, obviously Jesus. Uh, we look upon this one who has been pierced uh, for us and, and we say, but at what cost, right? At the cost of the death of the son of God. Now, of course, there's resurrection, there's joy in resurrection, but remember the resurrection does not erase the scars of the crucifixion from the body of Jesus, right? When Jesus appears to his disciples, he can point to his uh, wounds, right? To his scars that he still has um, as a sign of his identity to, sh to prove to them that he really is the same, the very same Jesus uh, who was crucified is the very one standing in their presence uh, in the case of uh, Thomas. Uh, uh, more than a week later. So what we see uh, in this text is both aspects of that. Uh, but there's one more thing uh, that really needs to um, impress upon you and you need to grab hold of, right? So while there is a mourning in all of Jerusalem in verse 11, right? And this mourning is great, right? It's as great as this other morning that had taken place in the past right so the little thing in the past is going to stand in for a big thing uh, to come um there is this general mourning right this general repentance we can read this as but there is also this insistence that each and every one is going to be participatory in this repentance right and so while we can have a general repentance Right, all of us together say sin, very bad. We don't want to, sin is not good and we want to go the way of Jesus instead. There is also a particular element to that where each one of us has to participate in that repenting act uh, individually. And as we'll see in our confession, it, it's not enough to merely say, I repent of my sins, right? And no, you have to, uh, repent of each one of your sins, uh, particularly or individually, as, as the modern English puts it. Um, and so both of those elements uh, we find here uh, in Zechariah uh, chapter 12. Now let's uh, jump our attention back to the gospel of Mark. And so Mark's gospel, uh, of course, begins abruptly. Um, and so Mark gives you a thesis statement uh, when he begins his gospel, he says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Uh, and so the way you want to understand what Mark 1.1 1, 1 is telling you is this is the thesis statement. This is the argument. Jesus is, the, this is the good news about Jesus, who is the son of God, right? This is the good news about Jesus, who is the Christ, right? The, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior, the Anointed One. Um, and so all of every, all of what follows in the gospel of Mark is attempting to prove the thesis statement, right? attempting to prove this statement, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the son of God, and this is good news for you. Okay. And so we jump very quickly uh, in Mark's gospel into the ministry of John, right? And the baptism of Jesus. And then Jesus is taken out into uh, the wilderness uh, with the Holy, by the power of the Holy Spirit after his baptism and the voice comes from heaven. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Spirit takes Jesus into the wilderness, right? And then Mark doesn't give us a lot of details about that wilderness, Both Matthew and Luke are a lot more detailed about what happens in that wilderness experience, especially with the temptation uh, by Satan. Right. And so he's in the wilderness for 40 days. Right? He's with the wild animals. Right. So he's not anywhere near town. Right. It's not like he's just sitting outside of town like Jonah. Right. Watching and waiting for the uh, for uh, Nineveh to be destroyed. He's way out in the wilderness where the wild animals are roaming. 
uh, and we're told the angels were ministering to him after that temptation by Satan. Right? And so that's what's uh, going on as Jesus emerges then in verse 14. Uh, and there we find now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee. So that's the region uh, around Galilee. Uh, Jesus mostly concentrated uh, on the uh, western edge of the Sea of Galilee, um, where Capernaum is. Um, but he's going to emerge into that region of Galilee, right? Now, this is not where you would expect him to be, right? So uh, there are basically three main places of major Jewish thought, right? Or major Jewish uh, leadership, of course. We tend to think of the most important one of those places is Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the center of the cult or the religious practice, uh, because that's where the temple is. Um, but the two major centers of Jewish thought at the time are actually Babylonia and uh, Alexandria. So in Egypt and Babylon, that's where the uh, major uh, Jewish thought is taking place uh, at the time. Um, but Jesus doesn't go to any of those, right? So any one of those, um, with possibly a fourth one being Antioch, but we come to that another time. Jesus doesn't go to any of those places. He goes to this uh, region where there's not a lot going on, right? In fact, you know, you'll get questions like, can anything good come out of Nazareth, right? And what do you mean he's a Galilean, right? Um, none of that computes, right? So uh, to tomorrow um, is not just uh, something that you'll hear about in the news that happened in the high church tradition, tomorrow is the Feast of the Epiphany, right? And the Epiphany uh, is typically the time where we celebrate the coming of the Magoi, the Magi from the East. Uh, these astrologers from the East, we call them kings, but the Bible never calls them kings. We, they were just rich, right? And so that's, <laughs> I guess when you're rich, we assume you're a king, um, but it calls them Magoi, uh, mages, wizards. Uh, it's, a, it's a good way to translate that word, although uh, when I suggested that, uh, a lot of my friends who know Greek don't like it. But they're um, stargazers, they're astrologers. That's the best way to think about them, right? And so they see something strange in the sky and it seems to be stopping, right? As opposed to a normal star formation, it seems to be stopping in a particular location. Uh, and so they go wandering that direction uh, and they go wandering that direction and they go, uh, if you re recall, they go originally to Herod's palace because uh, in Jerusalem, because I think, well, surely this is where he's got to be, but that's not where the king is. The king is not in the palace. The king is in Bethlehem. And so they go and find the Christ child in Bethlehem uh, and they present their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, and so, again, what we are finding out here is that the God is doing amazing things in unexpected places. And so that's when Jesus comes into Galilee, that's what's going on. Right? And so God is doing an amazing thing in an unexpected place. But what is it? What is this amazing thing that God is doing? Well, Jesus is going to start to preach. He's going to proclaim, right? And what he's going to proclaim is good news. Now, this word, uh, euangelion, and the Greek typically refers to uh, victory news, news that comes from uh, the battlefield to announce victory. Right, so you would bring back uh, the good news to the people to let you know, you know your king has won a decisive victory. Right? Now, if we have just read the Gospel of Mark and then we encounter this word gospel, right, which we did back in verse one, uh, and then we encounter it again here in verse 14, you might say, well, that, that's strange. What decisive victory uh, has God won? Uh, and the answer is actually to be found uh, here in verse uh, 13, right? What the victory that this, that has been won is actually over Satan. Now that victory will be complete at the cross and will be uh, absolutely complete at the second coming of Christ, but Jesus has already won a victory in a very important victory. So if you took our uh, beginnings and endings class, our Genesis and Revelation class, um, you will know and, and recognize that the temptation of, of Adam and Eve to follow after Satan, to say no to what God has said yes, and say yes to what God has said no, to arrogate to themselves the, the decision to decide what's right and wrong, right? 
that's the very temptation that Jesus, the new Adam, has faced, right? And so this new Adam has faced this temptation to reject the way of God and to go his own way. And he has overcome this temptation of Satan, right? And so he has not fallen like the first Adam, right? He has not succumbed to the corruption uh, that has taken all of humanity, right? And so what can he proclaim then down here? The gospel, the good news of God, right? And the good news of God is that God has won a decisive victory. And the decisive victory is the defeat of Satan, right? And because Satan is defeated, then the effects of Satan's temptation on humanity will also be defeated and are being defeated and were defeated, right? And so all of those things can be true at the same time because God's atemporal. Uh, and so this defeat of sin and death are also imminent, right? They're imminent. So this is the good news, right? And so if you're going to proclaim this good news, what are you going to tell people to do? Well, this is what is most important, right? And so Mark 1.15 is one of those verses, and you hear me say this often, but it's one of those verses that's just so important, it's probably better off to memorize it, right? Time is fulfilled, kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus is going to say, uh, make two statements and then give you two commands, right? Two statements and then two commands, right? So the first statement is the time is now, right? The time is fulfilled. In other words, all of that waiting, right? So Zechariah is seeing a future day, right? When, when we will look upon the one we have pierced, right? He's seeing something coming in the future, right? Um, Zephaniah, we just preached through Zephaniah not all that long ago, right? That day of the Lord that's coming, right? That day of the Lord, uh, which is dread for the enemies of God, but comfort for the people of God, right? When the Lord will rejoice over you, right? And will comfort you with his love, right? That beautiful image from uh, Zephaniah chapter three, right? That day has come, right? That day has come, right? And so the time has been fulfilled, the time of waiting, the time uh, of longing, the time of yearning, that time is over. The day of the Lord is upon you. The day of the Lord is upon you. Uh, and then we're told that the kingdom of God is at hand. And this uh, turn of phrase uh, comes to us from the Greek. And just like uh, in Greek, as it is used in English, uh, it can mean uh, two things. It can either mean um, something is close in time or it can mean something is close in proximity or close in distance, right? And so since Jesus has just used a temporal uh, image, the temptation is to uh, translate the kingdom of God is at hand to be a temporal idea, right? So the kingdom of God uh, is very near. It's going to be coming any moment now. Now, my argument is um, that's not good logic, right? So you don't, if he's already told you something temporally, like the time is fulfilled, we, this is it, we're here, the time is now, then it doesn't make much sense for you to say that the kingdom of God is at hand or it's just about to come around the corner. Now, you could make an argument that this is an already and not yet passage and that, and so Jesus is getting at that idea that the kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of God is coming. Uh, and that's a very good idea, but those tend to be uh, post-resurrection ideas uh, that we get. Um, and prior to the resurrection, uh, that's not really uh, the modus operandi of Jesus preaching, and certainly not of the apostles, which will come after the resurrection. So what I have always interpreted this to mean is that what Jesus is saying is that the time is now, this is it, you are in the time when this fulfillment, all of those promises, right, especially those covenantal promises, are going to be fulfilled, right? There's no more waiting. This is it. Everything's coming to a head, right? It's coming to a head. And he's saying it's coming to a head right here in your presence, right? So this kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Israel, not restarting what's been fallen and broken, but this thing that you actually want, right? That the kingdom of Israel was supposed to be a proxy for, Right, this thing that we actually long for, where God Himself is King. Right, remember that that's the original plan. Right, and it's when the people long for a King that God gives them a King. In First Samuel, we preached through that section not all that long ago too. Um, it, that time has come to an end, and that thing that you actually need is is here. Right, and what you actually need is for God to be King. For God to be king, right? And so this is it. This is the time. 
and this is the place. That's what Jesus is saying. So wherever Jesus is, the time is now, and this is the place. And so it, when you encounter Jesus by faith, that's still true. The time is now, and this is the place. Right? This is the place. The place for what? Well, for these two things to be done together, right? To repent and believe in the gospel. Right? To repent and believe in the gospel. Now, I, I spent a lot of time on this on Sunday morning. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this today. But there's a tension here between these two ideas, right? And we can find this tension in the work of Augustine, right? And so in Augustine, whichever way you like to pronounce, he pronounce his name, both are correct. Uh, in Augustine, uh, Augustine basically has two major contributions to theology, and they have to do with the two groups of heretics that he is opposing, the Donatists, uh, who were purists, uh, and then he also opposed Pelagians, uh, who uh, were wanting to um, basically make humanity par participatory, if not responsible for their own salvation, right? And so he will oppose both of these ideas. So on the one hand, with the Pelagians, uh, we get his uh, soteriology, right? And his soteriology is largely what inspires Calvin, and then, of course, the Westminster Divines, uh, to say that God is completely sovereign in the in salvation, right? God is the one who acts to save, right? We are the recipients of salvation, not the ones who um, cause it in any way. But the other side of this is his ecclesiology, right? And so he's opposed to the Donatus, pardon me. Ah, woo! Whoa, dust in the room. And so he's opposed to the Donatus, and the Donatus come about because uh, persecution has ended, right? And when persecution has ended, especially the great persecution in the East, the Diocletian uh, and Dionysian persecution. And so once this persecution is over, the question is, what do we do with people who recanted the faith? What do we do with people who handed over portions of the Bible to be burned? What do we do with people who ratted out uh, their bishop or their brothers and sisters, right? What do we do with people who lied to get a libelist, which was this little form you had to have to buy and sell things um, because it, it showed that you uh, sacrificed to the emperor. What do we do with people who, who for whatever reason, uh, didn't suffer persecution or, or escape persecution um, by cooperating with the oppression of the state? And the Donatists say, in essence, they're out. There's no coming back from that, right? And, and when I, I teach this particular heresy, there are always um, quasi-Donatists um, in our midst, right? People who are like, well, yeah, that sounds right. Like, well, except the Donatists were, went many, many steps beyond that. So the Donatists would say, look, um, if you sinned, especially in those ways, uh, you are out, and anything you did in the church is illegitimate, right? So let's say, you know, you had a pastor, and your pastor um, married, uh, baptized you, and presided over your wedding, and, um, you know, gave you the Lord's Supper, and heard your confessions, and all of those things. And everything was fine. He never recanted the faith. But the guy who baptized him did. The Donatists would actually teach that everything that, that your pastor, even though he never did anything wrong, everything your pastor uh, did was illegitimate because the man who baptized him made everything he did illegitimate. And so now your pastor's illegitimate, your marriage is illegitimate, your children are illegitimate. Uh, you're, you have to be rebaptized. You have to do all of this stuff all over again. Right? It becomes a, a nightmare of a system, right? Because the problem is, is, if you're an absolute purist in the church, and there are lots of people who want to be absolute purists in the church, is in the end, nobody gets to be in the church. Nobody. Because if you demand absolute purity, moral or spiritual or otherwise, you demand absolute purity in the church, in the end, nobody but Jesus can be in the church. 
Nobody but Jesus can be in the church. And so Augustine, uh, really working with Jerome and many other Western thinkers uh, in the church at the time, um, helps to codify a, a system that we would recognize as Roman Catholicism, their, their ecclesial system today with its many sacraments and all of those things. Uh, and the idea there is they want to create a system whereby somebody can move in a lifetime through this Christian life uh, and exercise or demonstrate true repentance. So that's the idea. Um, plus, the worthiness of the minister shouldn't come into play, right? And so that's a very important idea that Reformed theology picks up on and holds on to. The worthiness of your minister right, does not impact your baptism or your wedding or anything else that the minister may have done uh, for you, right? And because that's the act, especially in the sacraments, that's the act of God, not the act of man. And so therefore, those are legitimate. So we have a tension here uh, in, in the Western world, right? Western Christianity, right? And so on the one hand, you know, Roman Catholics really like uh, Augustine's uh, ecclesiology, uh, not necessarily big fans of his soteriology, uh, and Protestants, especially Reformed Protestants, big fans of his soteriology, not such big fans of his ecclesiology, right? And this creates a tension uh, in the Western church, right, between these two things. Uh, but well, my contention for you uh, is that Jesus holds those two ideas in tension, right? And we need to hold them in tension too, right? This idea that uh, you are saved uh, by faith, which is a gift from God, right? That's something that God gives to you, right? That salvation that, that a faith that bestows grace and uh, from the Holy Spirit upon you, right? All of that comes from God. And it leads you into a life of repentance, a turning away from sin and a turning to God, right? And so those two ideas uh, need to be held in tension, right? And the Bible often does this, right? It will take two ideas uh, and hold them in tension, right? So belief and repentance, right? So that which I, um, with my soul, with my very being, right, hold to be true, because belief here um, doesn't just mean, you know, assent as possible or as true, right? So it's not saying, uh, I believe God exists, right? That's not faith. That's not what we're talking about here. It, it's, it's probably trust is a better word to use today. Um, because belief has been emptied of what it used to mean uh, in our cultural context. Now you can argue and say, well, we need to reclaim the word. It's like, well, go ahead and do that. But if you're witnessing to somebody about what faith is, you know, the word that you really want to get across to them, especially uh, with younger people today uh, who tend to highly value authenticity, uh, is truth and trust, right? That this is true and I trust him. Right. Jesus is truth himself, and I trust him, right? So that's belief. And then repentance is, if I believe this is the truth, and I trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior, as my king, my prophet, my priest, the one mediator between God and man, if I trust Jesus, how then should I live? And that's repentance, right? And so your Faith leads to particular way of living in the world, a turning away from some things and a turning toward other things. And so we, uh, as Christians, need to hold those two things in tension, um, that, that there is uh, your uh, faith and repentance, and they need to it coexist in you at the same time. Now, if you try to cut the tension between those two things, uh, you'll end up in heresy, right? And so the heresy you'll yeah. end up with, Alexa, stop. The heresies that you'll end up in are, are typically uh, licentiousness uh, and illegalism. Right? And we can certainly see that um, at, at play in ancient heresies in the church, right? So for uh, legalism, you're not going to find much uh, worse legalists in the ancient world than the uh, Donatists, but you can also look to the Montanists, uh, as another particular uh, legalistic heresy, the Montanists were a doomsday cult. Uh, they believed that uh, God had sent three uh, prophet and two prophetesses. The prophet's name was Monetus, uh, and that the uh, world was going to come to an end and that they would know where to go. And what um, a lot of times in doomsday cults, so therefore, you know, you could do these uh, completely horrible uh, sinful things and get away with it. But the uh, Montanists actually said, and so therefore, 
absolute austerity was demanded, or it's a purity cult. Uh, absolute uh, austerity is demanded, and they even uh, went so far as to say um, that even if you were married, uh, you should refrain from sexual activity, you know, with your spouse, right? That, that, that's sort of the extreme example that I'm trying to get across to you. Um, and so they were uh, very legalistic uh, in what you could and couldn't do. They had rules for everything, and they were an attractive group. In fact, they were so attractive that one of the great um, minds of the early church, Tertullian, uh, was persuaded by the Montanists, mostly because of their rigorous austerity. He really, really liked uh, the way that they practiced the Christian faith, and he thought that they were right, and so he came over to them. Um, and so for licentiousness uh, in, the, in the ancient heresies of the church, um, you actually have to look in an interesting place, and that is in Marcion. All right, and so Marcion is most famous uh, for teaching uh, wrongly that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are not the same, right? And so he uh, ascribes the God of the Old Testament to law and judgment and wrath and death and destruction, and the God of the New Testament, which you'll call the Father of Jesus, uh, because he didn't really believe Jesus was God, um, he will uh, basically treat like Santa Claus, right? And so because the God of the New Testament is all about grace and mercy and love, uh, then therefore, you know, you, you, what you do with your life really has very little impact. Uh, and so you can do what you want because God has to forgive you and love you and be good to you, right? So usually we think of uh, Marcionism is kind of this anti-Semitic cult. You know, he really w was anti-Semitic in, in the most technical sense of it. He hated Judaism and he wanted to strip Judaism from Christianity, which would make it, um, oh yeah, in incomprehensible. I mean, it just doesn't make much sense without the two together. But that's what he really wanted to do. He wanted to create um, a Greek version of Christianity without any Judaism in it. Uh, which would make it incoherent, just incoherent, just wouldn't make any sense. Um, but he allowed for, you know, licentiousness, or at least that's what uh, his inter... We don't really have any of the surviving works of Marcion because they were all destroyed um, by the church. And so we just kind of have the arguments that people made against him, but that's one of the things they accuse him and his followers of. And so the way you avoid both legalism and licentiousness, licentiousness, um, you know, the root word there is license. You can think of it as grace as a license to sin. Uh, and legalism is, you know, you must do all the right things or God won't love you, right? The way you keep uh, away from sort of those uh, heresies, those extremes, uh, is you maintain the tension that, that Jesus maintains. Repentance and faith belong together. Now, we've been uh, walking through the Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation or the sequence of salvation, we've called it, uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, mistaken impressions that we can get in the Ordo Salutis uh, is that there is, uh, these, this is a temporal order. This happens, then that happens, then that happens, then that happens. Um, but in reality, a lot of these things happen simultaneously or nearly simultaneously, right? So faith and repentance uh, really belong together, right? And so you may be able to logically order those two things, but in your own experience, uh, knowing you're a sinner and in need of a savior happens at the same time that the, that the spirit actually offers to you grace, right? Actually offers to you grace and actually gives it to you, right? And the only reason that you would receive that is because you repent, because you turn away from sin and you turn toward the grace that's actually given to you, right? So chicken and an egg, right? Should it be repent and believe or believe and repent? Uh, and the answer is they basically happen simultaneously. But just as faith is not a one moment thing, right? When you were five years old with grandma, she offers you a cookie, you took the cookie and said the sinner's prayer, right? And now it's magic. You said the magic words and now God has to be good to you. No, faith is a, uh, it's a change in who you are and it's a change in how you orient yourself in living in the world. So to repentance is not a one-time thing that you did, right? You turned away from sin and turned to the savior, but it creates a lifestyle. And it's a lifestyle of turning away from sin and, and turning to God. And so that's, generally what the Westminster Divines are trying to get across to you 
uh, in chapter 15. So let's uh, turn our attention to the confession itself, uh, and we'll start there in paragraph one. So um, in my email, uh, the classic, uh, this is titled Repentance Unto Life in the modern English version. They call it Repentance Leading to Life. Um, it's, it's an okay update, um, but I prefer the, the older language because um, this has a way of telling you that you know, this is the way that will lead you to life as opposed to repentance actually being life-giving itself, right? And so that's more what the older idea is. So I just set aside my complaint about the modern English version for the time being. <laughs> okay, paragraph one. Repentance, which leads to life, is the blessed product of the gospel working in believers' lives. And so right away, uh, where does repentance come from? Well, from our, our reading of Mark 1 15, it's very clear that repentance comes from the gospel, right? You hear the good news, right? The victory of your God, right? You've heard the good news of Jesus, right? And so the product of that, right? Accompanying faith, right? The product of that is repentance. Right? And so repentance is twofold. So if you read our Wednesday email today, it made that pretty clear, right? Repentance is uh, not just uh, not just turning away from sin, but actually turning to God in the things of God, right? It's it's the changing of the mind, right? So metanoia is the classic Greek word uh, that we translate repentance, right? And metanoia uh, literally means to turn around, right? to basically do a 180, right? So you are going this way, and then you turn around, and you're going to go that way, right? So you're headed in the wrong direction, and then you're going to turn, and you're going to go in the right direction. Uh, but perhaps a better colloquial uh, translation of metanoia, uh, and this will actually get to uh, how the Apostle Paul especially uses the word, uh, is to change one's mind, right? So the renewal of the mind or, or the setting of the mind on things above, right? Those ideas that come to us from the Apostle Paul, that's really what's going on with metanoia, right? It's adopting a new way of living, a new way of seeing yourself and how you exist in the world. And that comes from the truth of Jesus, from the gospel of Jesus, from the victory of Jesus being applied to you. Right? It actually changes how you see yourself and how you and how you live in the world. Right? And as a result of that, what you actually do in the world will begin to change all at once. No, but slowly over time and then all at once. Yes. So this how do you how does one get led deeper into repentance how does one go deeper into repentance the gospel it's the same thing over and over and over again right the gospel is the message of the church right period it is the only message that we have that god saves sinners like you like me in jesus that's it that's all we have and so we can certainly talk about how that is lived out in the world and there are various Bible passages that will lead that. So like this Sunday, we'll talk a lot about compassion and weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice, right? Those kinds of ideas uh, will come out uh, in our understanding of this, but the gospel is the base, it's it, right? And so some people say, well, that's the basics and we're ready for more advanced stuff. So, no, nobody's ready for the advanced class, nobody. Right. The only way you're ready for the advanced class is because you graduate, right? And that's Presbyterian speak, you know, graduate to glory. That's Presbyterian speak for saying you die um, or Jesus comes back, one or the other. That's it. That's the only way you get to the advanced class. Um, and so we all need the gospel over and over and over again because the gospel produces repentance in us, right? Because we have to confront that twin reality of the cross over and over and over and over again. The wonder of God's grace that God the Son should die for us and for our salvation and the absolute horror of sin that the redemption of God's elect should cost the blood of the sinless Jesus, right? Those two things are always true at the same time. And so the gospel produces in us repentance because it shows us once more the ugliness, the vileness of our sin and the blessed and wonder of God's salvation all at the same time. And so, you know, we can agree with Martin Luther, at least on, on this point, that we are simultaneously saint and sinner, and the gospel always 
re reiterates that idea to us. Okay, so what do the Westminster Divide say? Well, remember the confession is particularly for elders, right? Both teaching and rulings, particularly for them, and is to instruct them and tell them, okay, this is what needs to happen in the church, right? And as we go further into the confession, that becomes much more clear, right? That they are setting up a theological system for what you actually do in the church, right? And so here's one of those ideas. Along with the doctrine of faith in Christ, it is a doctrine to pre preach by every minister of the gospel. Right? So if you have a preacher and you only ever hear faith in Christ, right? Believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. That's good, right? You do need to hear that, but it's not the full gospel because you also have to hear repentance, right? Believe and repent. That's what your Lord and Savior said, right? If the time is now and the kingdom of God is at hand, believe and repent, repent and believe. That has to go together, right? Like the right hand and the left hand, like hand and glove, like peanut butter and jelly. Um, those two ideas just simply belong together. Okay, so in paragraph two, we're gonna get a little bit more into what it means uh, to actually repent, right? And so we've just been told that repentance is produced by the gospel, so what does it mean to repent? We've alluded to some of this already, but let's see what the divines have to say. In this repentance, the sinner is able to see his sins as God sees them. That's important. Right? It's not merely that, you know, ah, well, you know, I messed, I, I made a mistake, right? Sin is not a mistake. No. What is sin? Right? You, you need to see it as God actually sees it, as filthy and hateful and involving great danger, danger to the sinner because they are completely contrary to the holy nature and righteous law of God. Strike from your mind the idea that an adequate defense for your sin is, oh, well, I'm only human. Strike that idea from your mind and never let it come up from your lips again because it doesn't take into reality what sin truly is. Sin is filthy and hateful, and it is a grave danger to you when you sin. Because when you sin, you are a rebel against the holy and righteous God. That's what sin really is. It's rebellion against God. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous to stand against the one and only God who created all things and is the king of all of his creation, the one who creates and is providentially cares for all of his creation, to stand and raise your fist to heaven and say, I will not do what you want. That's a dangerous thing to do. Right now, why should you strike from your mind and your lips the idea, oh, well, I'm only human? Because to be truly human is to be Jesus. Right? To be truly human is to be Jesus. See, we get this idea uh, that we're, we're really human. And Jesus was like really kind of the best of us, but not, you know, he wasn't like the rest of us. You know, it's like we're, we're all a bunch of dirty, rotten sinners. He wasn't like us. And so he doesn't really know what it's like. Well, no, the Bible says actually he knows everything about what it means to be human. He's tempted in every way, just like you are. But he was sinless, right? That's what the author of Hebrews wants you to know over and over and over again. To be truly human does not mean to be a sinner. To be truly human means to be Jesus. Right? When Jesus goes out into the wilderness and is tempted by Satan, it's demonstrating that he's truly human. When he overcomes Satan, he's demonstrating what true humanity means. True humanity is not rebellious toward God, but rather chooses God over rebellion. And so to come into uh, an understanding that Jesus is the definition of what it means to be truly human uh, is to then get a real view on why your sin is, is as wretched as it is, why you are as wretched as, as, as you are when you sin. It's because it, it's rebellion, right? And so adopting an attitude toward your sin, right, that you can you know, kind of minimize its, its 
vileness, you can minimize your wickedness, you can minimize its filth and hatefulness, you can minimize all of this stuff. It, it's, uh, it's be, as we would tell, uh, I would tell my children, it's, it's behavior unbecoming of a Christian, right? And so it's just not okay, right? And so we can't treat sin as if it's, you know, not that big a deal. It, it is a big deal. And every sin is a big deal, every single one. Uh, but more than that, there is uh, unfortunately another step beyond that, right? So if we then take our sin and we say, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm only human and this particular sin, you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's bad. I probably shouldn't do it, but you know, I've got reasons, right? And then we get into self-justifying behavior. It's like, well, you don't understand. In my particular case, there was a very good reason why I had to engage in this particular sinful behavior, right? Or maybe we don't get into self-justifying. Maybe instead we say, well, there's no good reason for doing this, but it may just get so much, you know, we kind of have these little sins that we do that we think, well, I'll do the little sin so I don't do the bigger sin behind it, right? And so then we try to keep sin as a pet and, you know, we feed it our, our, a little bit of rebellion all the time and, and we just try to pretend that it's not going to devour us, right? It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, keeping a there's just crazy people that keep big cats as pets. If any of you keep big cats as pets, uh, see me after class, you know, but these are giant predators that people keep around and they try to pretend that they're, you know, because when they're little, they're cute and all of this stuff. Um, but eventually they turn into giant predators and if they get hungry enough, they will eat you. That's just what they do. Sin is like that. You can't keep sin as a pet. You can't minimize sin. You can't dismiss it. You can't pretend that it's not a big deal. Every sin is a problem. Every single one. Now, what the divines say next is equally important, right? So you have to stare down the wretchedness of sin, but you also need to understand something. Right? So they say, understanding that God in Christ is merciful to those who repent. Sinner suffers deep sorrow for and hates his sin, and so he determines to turn away from all of them. And turning to God, he tries to walk with him according to all his commandments. And because you know the mercy of Christ, right? So it, let's say you don't know the mercy of Christ. You're not a Christian, right? You still have a moral compass. You still have a conscience. It may be broken, but you still have one. You still have things you think are right and things that you think are wrong. Well, what happens if you do what you think is wrong, right? Well, then you have to justify yourself. Then you have to minimize it. You have to do all of these things, right? But as a Christian, you don't have to do that. You can be honest about it with God in confession, and you can tell him the truth. And how can you do this? How can you walk boldly to the throne of grace? Because you know that in Christ, God is merciful to those who repent. So as a result of that, you can stare at your sin for what it really is and mourn for it, right? Remember that Zechariah passage? You can mourn for your sin, each one of us, right? You can hate your sin. In fact, you should hate your sin, right? You should hate it, right? I don't, as a Christian pastor, I don't get to tell you to hate a lot of things because you really shouldn't, but you can hate sin. Not only can you hate sin, you should hate sin, right? Because when you hate it, when you realize that it has caused a rift between you and your beloved Savior, when it's caused a rift between you and the God who sent Jesus to save you, right? When you realize what it has done to your own spiritual life right? and the relationships of, with those around you, and especially your relationship with God, then you will be led into this metanoia, right? And this metanoia, this turning around, turn away from sin, turn to God both at the same time, right? It can't just be one and it can't just be the other, right? It has to be both because the problem is, right? So let's say you turn away from sin, right? And you determine, right? I have broken, you know, the, I have um, committed perjury. I think that's the example I use Sunday morning, right? I've committed perjury. Um, and as a result of committing perjury, right? Some injustice has happened, right? And so I commit myself to this day that I will know I will turn away from perjury and I will never commit perjury again. Well, you've actually done nothing. Right? If all you do is turn away from sin, you do actually nothing. 
you just don't do anything, right? So the Bible tells me not to have, uh, uh, not to worship a graven image. So I'm not going to worship a graven image. Congratulations. You can sit on your couch for the rest of eternity. And as long as you don't worship a graven image, uh, you have accomplished the task. But that's not really what the scripture is calling you to do, right? It's not merely calling you to cease from these activities. It's calling you to be different than you were before. And through the power of grace and faith, it's enabling you to be different than you were before because that's the Holy Spirit at work in you, right? And so we have to not just turn away from sin, but turn to God and walk with him according to his commandments, right? According to his commandments, right? So if you need the quick Cliff Notes version of the commandments, Jesus tells you they are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so you will turn away from your sin and you will turn to God and walk with God according to those commandments. Okay, so now we have to talk about what repentance is not, right? Because uh, the divines are very aware of Roman Catholic practices of penance and they don't want those Roman Catholic practices of penance to be entering into the minds uh, of the people that they are teaching. And so they are saying that your repentance is not, uh, although repentant is not any satisfaction for sin, right? So as a Protestant believer who probably doesn't have a lot of interaction with Roman Catholicism, didn't grow up Catholic like me, that doesn't make much sense, right? It's like, okay, well, I, of course my repentance isn't satisfaction for my sins. Jesus paid it all, all to Christ I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow, right? We sing that all the time. Of course, my repentance isn't a satisfaction for sin. Only Jesus is the satisfaction for my sins. It's like, very good. That's what the Bible actually teaches. That's good. You should believe that. But what they're standing against is the Roman Catholic pros, uh, practice of penance, right? And penance is this idea uh, that you have to do things in order to, um, in order to um, actually bring yourself back into the presence of God, right? So you go and because you have to have the mediation of the magisterium of the church, you go to confession, you confess your sins to the priest and the priest gives you uh, a course of penance, things you must do to restore your relationship with God, right? And so usually that's saying certain prayers, but let's say you did something like, you know, I hit my sister, uh, which probably is something I confess more than once, um, then you'd be told, and you have to go and apologize to your sister and make amends, right? So that'd be your penance, right? So you have to go and do something nice for your sister. Uh, it's the worst, right? And so, but the idea there that the Westminster Divines are saying is, look, it's making amends and doing all those things may be part of your penance, right? So let's go back to the guy who commits perjury, right? Guy who commits perjury, you know, lies in court, and as a result, bad things happen. Bad things happen because this person lied in court. Um, and so part of repentance in that man's life or that woman's life would probably be telling the truth, even if it costs you dearly, is going and saying, I said something false under oath, uh, and it led to these consequences, and I need to tell the truth, and the truth is this, right? So what we have to understand is while that may be part of your repentance, it is not the satisfaction for your sin, nor does that repentance cause the forgiveness of sins, right? Since forgiveness is an act of God's voluntary grace in Christ, right? So you are not by your repentance causing God to act or regard you in a particular way. Yet, so let's stop there, pause, right? You cannot force God to do something or regard you in a particular way, right? You can't make, you can't satisfy your own sin by your penance. You can't force God to forgive you because God's grace is voluntary. God is the one who chooses to bestow grace and forgiveness, right? And he does so in Christ. Yet, we're told, it is necessary to all sinners, and no one may expect to be forgiven without it, right? So if you, um, if you are a sinner like me, and you commit sins, and you don't seek repentance, right? You don't seek to turn away from them, right? Even if you fall to, into that temptation, and you fall to that sin over and over and over again, right? It's not the, the idea isn't, well, I committed this sin, and now I'll never do it again. Right? Well, you may, you may, right? Because we're you know, 
we, we've got that push me, pull me between the old and the new man, right? And sin can be, um, for God's own mysterious purposes, can sometimes you know, rise up in us in such a way that it can seem to overwhelm us to the point where we even lose our sense of salvation, right? That's how bad things can get. But, you know, what we need to understand in, in, in all of this is that forgiveness is God's act. Yet, repentance is our life of faith. It's just who we are. Right? And so, you know, kicking the door open to the kingdom of God and saying, well, you know, I've done these sins, but they're no big deal. I'm just going to come wandering in. Well, the Westminster Divines are saying, well, you know, if, if you're not weeping and mourning, if you don't hate that sin, right, can you really expect the righteous and holy God to forgive you. You can't make him forgive you no matter what. But if you, you know, basically are thumbing your nose at God, do you think that's going to end well for you, right? That's what paragraph three is trying to get you to, trying to help you wrap your head around, right? Repentance is the life of the Christian. And without repentance, right, you really should not expect forgiveness because right? that's just licentiousness. It's just licentiousness. It's just telling God, well, you know, I said the magic words uh, with grandma when I was five years old, when she gave me the cookie to pray the sinner's prayer. And so now you have to be good to me, right? It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I live my life. It doesn't matter, you know, I'm saved. And so you got to, you got to let me in heaven, right? Or whatever mentality I, I run into these days. It's like, that's not what's going on here. Because if you really know God, if you really love God, if you really are, are convicted of your sin, you hate it and you want to turn away from it. And you shouldn't expect forgiveness right, while you're trying to excuse or justify your own sin. So that's what the Westminster Divines are saying. It doesn't cause God to forgive you, but if you're not repentant, you shouldn't expect forgiveness. But I would go one step further. Maybe this is beyond what Westminster Divine say. I, I would say if you're not repentant, you probably aren't even looking for forgiveness. It's probably not something you're interested in. So but that's Pastor Bill, not, not what the confession saying. Okay, paragraph four. Just as there is no sin uh, so small that it does not deserve damnation. Let me say that again. It's very important. There is no sin so small that it does not deserve damnation, right? The wages of sin is death, right? Not the wages of, you know, really big sins like murder, all right, is death. No, the wages of sin is death. Doesn't No, there is no sin so small that doesn't deserve damnation, right? We can rank sin on its seriousness as human beings, and even the Bible can help you with that. But the just end of all sin is damnation. That's where it belongs. Okay, so you can't say that there's any sin in your life that is so small that it's insignificant. No, every sin is significant, right? Because every sin meets its just end in death and damnation. But this is really what the Westminster Divines are trying to say. So there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. You're not too far gone. Doesn't matter what that sin is, you are not so far that God cannot forgive you. Because just as you can't kick the door open to the kingdom of God and tell God what that He must forgive you, you also can't cower and tell God that He cannot forgive you. Because both of those are, are a power play on God, right? You're trying to tell God what He can and cannot do. And so what the Westminster Divines are trying to say is. Don't underestimate what God can do, ever. Now, this creates problems because people are like, well, you know, I, I think that there are some people who deserve damnation and it would really bother me if, you know, they repented of their sins. As, as a Christian, it shouldn't. As I, I, I said to the Sunday morning class, and I'll say it again, I've got enough sins of, you know, my own, even as a pastor that I'm dealing with that, you know, I don't have time to really condemn other people for their sins. It's, it's, 
it, it's not something that I'm interested in doing. So I just talk about grace and the call to believe and repent. Right? So turn away from your sins and turn to Christ. Right? There's no, there's none of us have become sin free, right? That's what the first part of paragraph four is about. And none of us have sinned so greatly that God cannot forgive us. So repent and believe the gospel. Okay, paragraph five. Okay, believers should not be satisfied with general repentance. So what is general repentance? General repentance is this idea where I say, uh, I have sinned and therefore I repent of all my sins. So, okay, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? You should repent of all your sins, but, but it's not enough either, right? Because rather it's everyone's duty to try to repent of every individual sin individually or every, I like the old language, every particular sin particularly. And yes, general repentance is important. And general repentance is this idea that um, I'm going to turn away from sin in general. But at least in your own confessional life, in your own prayer life, in your own life, you need to be um, confessing individual sins and repenting of them individually. Right? And so whatever those sins are in your life, right? It's not enough to say, God, well, I sinned today and I repent of my sins. It's like, no, this is, you know, be honest with God. Tell God that he already knows. So, I mean, you're not telling him anything he doesn't already know. You know tell him what's really going on and then seek repentance from that particular sin particularly. Okay, so what about confession? Well, again, what the Westminster Divines are trying to get away from is the uh, Catholic, Anglo or Roman Catholic practice of confession as a sacrament. But they don't want to exclude the possibility that there are times in which we need to confess our sins to somebody else, or maybe to church. Jesus will talk about that. Okay, paragraph six. Everyone is also bound to confess privately his sins to God and to pray for forgiveness uh, for them. Right? So your confession uh, and, and prayers uh, for forgiveness should be part of your daily prayer practice. Right? Confession, prayer for forgiveness, and forsaking the sins which have been forgiven will find God's mercy. Right? Good news. Very good news, right? So this idea that when you confess your sins and pray for forgiveness and you forsake the sins that led to that whole process, then you'll find uh, mercy for your sins. Okay, but what about um, if your sin has harmed somebody in the church or the church itself, right? Or brought dishonor on the church, right? So similarly, anyone who sins against a spiritual brother or the church should be willing to confess privately or publicly to demonstrate sorrow for his sin to openly state his repentance to those whom he has hurt. So if your sin, right, didn't just harm your relationship with God, but harmed, especially somebody else in the church, or harmed the church itself, you should seek to confess, right, seek forgiveness, right, apologize, right, not that, oh, I'm sorry, you know, but an actual honest to goodness, I, I hurt you, and I'm sorry, right, and seek Right. In that, that demonstration of that apology, right, seek repentance, right? Seek to make amends. It's another way to think of this with the person that you've hurt. Right? So if you defrauded somebody, you stole money from them, right? You should seek to make it right. If you, you know, yelled at your kids, you know, you shouldn't just apologize to your children. You should seek to make that relationship right whatever the case may be, right? So if that's with an individual, you should seek that to, you should seek that time to apologize. And if it's with the church itself, you know, you should be open to the idea that there are times when you may have to come before the church and say, this is what I did and I harmed the church and I'm sorry. I've had that happen once in my ministry. It was a tearful time um, with the man confessing the sin before the whole church because he'd harmed the church you know, by his actions. And it's tough. It only happened once and I, I don't know if it'll ever happen again. Um, but those are important things to do. 
Now, what if you are on the receiving side of somebody who is confessing and seeking forgiveness? Well, we're told they in turn are to be reconciled to him and to receive him in love, right? So somebody comes to you, right, to confess and to seek forgiveness, then we are to seek reconciliation. Now, reconciliation does not mean uh, that we pretend nothing bad ever happened because, you know, part of the repentance process is making amends. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we put ourselves in dangerous situations, right? So if somebody comes to you right, and confesses that they, you know, this is a rather extreme example, but confesses that they molested your child, right? Um, reconciliation does not mean you ask them to babysit on Friday night. Right? That's a bad idea. Right? That's not reconciliation. Rather, reconciliation is seeking to forgive and to find a way forward in the love of Christ to live as brothers and sisters. And so that's tough. It's hard. It's messy, right? And some days are going to be better than others in how you seek to navigate that. But the reception in love is the offering of peace and forgiveness, right? So in church on Sunday, you know, after the prayer confession and the assurance of pardon, uh, we have the passing of the peace. And the passing of the peace is usually our time when we turn to one another uh, and we shake hands and say, how are you? Or peace be with you or whatever it is we're going to say. Um, it's also your time, if there's somebody in the church that you harm, to go up to them and to apologize and to seek forgiveness and to offer forgiveness when it's sought. Now, how does that actually work out and what's the process right, of reconciliation and, and the process of repentance and reception and love? Uh, sometimes it's simple, sometimes it's complex. And uh, you know, we're not going to go into a lot of details about that, but sometimes you need help. You know, to help navigate that process as part of why you have elders and especially a pastor uh, to help navigate that process for you. But the idea here is confession is important. Repentance is important. Uh, and if you have faith in Jesus and you are trying to pretend that the sins that you uh, currently have in your life are no big deal, you need to stop that. You need to see them for what they truly are, repent of them, and turn to Jesus and walk with him, one who died to save you from your sins. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful for uh, this time together and certainly for the words of our Savior. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. If we are to be the people of Jesus, this is how we shall live. So lead us, Lord, to not just put our faith in Jesus, but also to hear him to repent of our sins and to follow after the one who died to save us. We pray in his beautiful, holy, and righteous name, the name of Jesus. Amen.